Oftentimes, students are a little unsure what to make of these differential equations. How do we use them? They're not really written in an operator form where we can put in some source in the uh, resulting field or voltage or current will result. <clears throat> what we're saying with these differential equations, just like Maxwell's equations, which are differential equations, is we're saying that only uh, functions, in this case, voltage uh, functions of uh, vo voltage and current um, that satisfy these two equations simultaneously can physically exist. I can go through and come up with any arbitrary function of V with respect to position Z and likewise some arbitrary function of I with respect to position Z. But if I were to insert it into these two equations, the function V and I, it would un be unlikely if I just arbitrarily um, um, wrote them down that they would satisfy either one of these two equations, that I get the left side equal to the right on either one of these, let alone both of them. Um, only functions of current and voltage, in other words, the current and voltage along a transmission line that satisfies simultaneously both of these uh, equations uh, can exist physically on the transmission line. So the question is, what are those functions? What can exist physically on a transmission line? Our uh, uh, task then is to try to solve these differential equations so we can determine explicitly the functions V and I with respect to position Z. First, we're going to make a bit of an approximation that will greatly simplify our mathematics. And this approximation is one that is valid for the problem that we have at hand. And that is uh, a situation where we're examining radio frequency, microwave frequencies, very high frequency uh, electrical engineering in the hundreds of megahertz or gigahertz or tens of gigahertz. And so for those conditions, we have a situation where J omega L is almost certainly much, much larger in magnitude than the value of R. Remember, using wires that have very good conductivity, so uh, uh, conductance rather. Uh, so um, um, the resistance per unit length is going to be a very small number uh, in comparison to J omega L. Not because L is particularly large, but because of course omega is going to be extremely large. The same thing with respect to conductance and um, um, the uh, J omega C. Again, um, the magnitude of what's on the right is going to be much larger than G. And the reason for that is not because of C, it's because of the omega that we have. So we go back and we look at our um, um, telegrapher equations. And for the uh, series impedance that we have, R plus J omega L, we can go through and um, replace it then with simply J omega L. There was a minus sign out front, so that's why we got the minus J omega, Hill, J omega L here. Likewise, for the admittance per unit length that we had for the other telegrapher equations, where we had G plus J omega C, now we can replace that with simply J omega C, of course, the minus sign that was out front. And this will simplify things and make our math uh, a bit easier in terms of the analysis. Now, we call this the lossless approximation, where we basically are saying that uh, the resistance per unit length is equal to zero and the conductance per unit length is equal to zero. Now, that's not what we're really saying. We're just saying R is so small, it's much, much less than the magnitude of a magnitude of J omega L, in other words, omega L, and G is much, much less than omega C. So having made the lossless approximation, our telegrapher equations simplify to this result. And these are coupled differential equations. And by coupled again, we mean we have uh, voltage here in one equation and we have the derivative of voltage in the other. We have current in one equation and the derivative of current in the other. And our quest is to find the uh, voltage and current functions of Z that will satisfy these differential equations. Now this is very much like having coupled uh, algebraic equations. We might have one equation of X and Y and a second equation of X and Y. How do we solve those equations? Well, we try to decouple them. We try to rearrange them so that we have one equation that is a function of x only and another one that's a function of y only. And of course, then we can find the solution usually uh, relatively easily.
So we get the same thing here for these couple differential equations, and it's relatively straightforward. I won't show the uh, uh, details here. You can work, work them out. If we go through, though, and we take, let's say, the first derivative with respect to z for this first equation, what would we get? Well, we get a second derivative here, and then we get minus j omega l times the first derivative of i. And that's important because we know what the first derivative of i is. That's given by the second equation. So we can replace the first derivative of i here with this and that allow us to come up with one decoupled equation. The second derivative of v is equal to minus j omega l times <coughs> the value of minus j omega c times v. So we put all of that into one equation and we get this result. Now this uh, all of our j omega l's and j omega c's are combined into a value that we'll call beta. And beta turns out to be, if you go through and do the math, beta turn beta squared rather turns out to be omega squared times L C. So this looks like a shorthand here, like we've just replaced some, you know. Uh, an expression, you know, in here we want to simplify things so we don't have to write so much. It turns out beta is a very important fundamental parameter in transmission line theory. So this becomes our first decoupled differential equation. We can do the same thing to decouple the second. It will have the same form if we take the first derivative of this equation. So we get the second derivative of i on this side and the first derivative of v here, but the first derivative of v, of course, we know is all this, and so we can insert that, replace the first derivative, and then we get the second derivative of i is equal to <clears throat> then uh, uh, minus j omega c times all of this. When we put that in there, we can write it in this form, and once again, we can write it in terms of beta. And you can see the nice symmetry that results here for both current and voltage. The second derivative of the voltage with respect to z uh, is simply proportional to that function of z. The proportionality constant is the value of b, and I say it's a constant. It's a constant with respect to position z. Of course, it depends on frequency omega. The same thing here for uh, current. These two equations are known as the transmission line wave equations. And so now our task becomes simpler. We have to go through and find a function of voltage V which satisfies this equation and one likewise for I which satisfies this. And you can see because of the similarities, if we find the solution for one, we've effectively found the solution for the other as well. Now, at first, finding the solutions to the uh, wave equations might seem a little bit daunting. It doesn't seem to make sense. We say we take the second derivative of a function, and the result is essentially the same function within a proportionality constant beta. What function can we take derivatives of it and still have the function essentially unchanged? Well, there's one function where that's uh, that can occur, and that is the exponential uh, value. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. And so that really becomes the uh, solutions to uh, uh, the wave equation. They are in the form of an exponential function with respect to z. If you go through and, uh, and look at it closely, what you'll find is that one function that would satisfy uh, uh, the wave equation for voltage is simply e to the minus j beta z. Remember, we had that minus beta squared that's in there. And if you insert uh, e to the minus j beta z, take the second derivative, what you'll find is uh, you'll get a result which is equal to minus beta squared uh, times the... Um, X, the exponential function e to the minus j beta z. So it satisfies the equation. You can insert this into that first differential equation and you'll find the left side is equal to the right. So that's e to the minus j beta z. But you'll likewise find that e to the plus j beta, j beta z will also satisfy that differential equation. Take the second derivative of e to the plus j beta z and you'll get minus beta squared times e to the plus j beta z. So e to the plus j beta z is also a solution. We could write it as e to the plus or minus j beta z. Now, the second derivative is a linear operator. And so if the solution, uh, we have a solution to that differential equation, we could also multiply that solution by some complex or number, some constant, and it would also be a solution. So we take e to the minus j beta z and we multiply by some constant out front, and we'll call that uh, that uh, constant seems kind of clunky, but we'll show there's a reason later on, v0 plus. 
Again, I try to emphasize that all this depends on frequency. We change frequency, we're going to get a different constant here. Um, and that likewise is a solution. So insert this first term into your first differential equation. Take the second derivative of this and compare it to minus beta of all of this, and you'll find that they are equal to each other. Same thing for the second solution of e to the plus j beta c. We can multiply it by some arbitrary constant, and we'll find that it too is a solution. Finally, because the second derivative is a linear operator, the sum of any solution is also a solution. And so we can take the sum of these two things and find that it likewise satisfies the first of the, uh, of the uh, telegrapher wave equations or uh, um, the wave equation of a telegraph. So, um, or a transmission line, rather. Um, the, um, um, and you can do that. Go ahead and insert that in there and, and show for yourself that that is the case. For current, it's basically the same math, just replacing uh, voltage with current. And so this likewise is a solution for uh, the second of the, uh, to, uh, for the um, transmission line wave equation, rather. Um, so the question, so we say these are, these are solutions. Um, are they the only solutions? Is there some other solution? And it turns out there are no other solutions. Uh, mathematically, you might come up with a solution that uh, uh, looks different than either one of those, but it turns out we can always take that solution and rewrite it in a form uh, that looks like this. It all kind of depends on what constants that we're going to put out front here and what we do with those complex constants. So really, this is the general form of the solution. Any physical um, oscillation results uh, along a transmission line results in a complex voltage with respect to position and a complex current with respect to position that is written in this form. Every solution can be written in this form. Now, the question, of course, are what are these four complex constants? Um, and, of course, that sh will depend on uh, ultimately what is attached to the transmission line. Notice also we have beta here. <clears throat> Remember beta depend <coughs> excuse me. Beta depends on omega, the square root of omega. So uh, frequency omega there. So all of this depends on the frequency. We get a solution for a transmission line and the voltage and current. If we change the frequency of the sinusoidal oscillation, we're going to get a different solution. It'll still have this form, but the value of beta will be different, and certainly the value of these complex constants will be excuse me, different as well. Pardon me. Finally, worry about these four complex constants. Uh, these four complex constants are called the wave amplitudes uh, of the solution, and so we'll get back to that. But uh, these are very important. And again, I call them constants, but what I mean by... <coughs> excuse me. Pardon me. What I mean by constants is they are constant with respect to position z. Obviously, they change when we change the frequency omega. But with respect to position z, these are four constants. So it's very important that you understand what this result means. So what does this mean? The solutions on the previous page are these solutions. Um, where are the variables? Where can we account for the richness in what we assume is the different solutions uh, for the current and voltage along the transmission line? Well, they are all encompassed in these four complex numbers. What are these four complex numbers? We'll see in a second. It's determined from what's connected to either end of the transmission line. But ultimately, these are the four values that we have to find for any transmission line problem. Beta is what beta is. Remember, beta squared is <clears throat> uh, omega squared times uh, the square root of LC, or I'm sorry, omega squared times LC. Beta is omega times the square root of LC. So omega is determined by our source. We can't do anything about that. L and C is determined by the transmission line. The actual voltage and current that we get for a physical circuit where we've attached things to a source on one end and a load on the other, that's those things depend on these are, will affect these four numbers. When we say we want to analyze a transmission line circuit to find the answer, really all we have to do are find four complex numbers. That's it. People refer to transmission line theory or microwave engineering sometimes as black magic. It's all kind of incomprehensible for a lot of engineers because it seems so uh, confusing and we have 
complex mathematics, real and imaginary, uh, that goes on there. Um, you know, it seems to violate uh, KVL and KCL. Uh, of course, it doesn't. Um, but in the end, it's not all that hard. All we have to do for any transmission line problem is find four complex numbers. We'll find out later that's not really, that's even overstating the problem because we'll find that two of these uh, two, we have really have two pairs of complex numbers which are very uh, directly related. In the end we'll find really we just have to find two complex numbers and we found the solution for everything that we want. And I want to put plant that uh, idea in your mind right now because students um, uh, oftentimes end up spending way too much time trying to find uh, the answer for these transmission line problems. Take what's given you, find your four numbers, from your four numbers, then you can determine anything else that the problem asks for. Everything gets down to finding these numbers. If you find the numbers, you have found the answer, period. There is no other thing, nothing else to be determined. So how do we find these four complex wave amplitudes, these four complex constants? Um, they depend on what is connected to either end of the transmission line. We think about it, what we did was find the solutions for the telegrapher equations by finding the transmission line wave equations and finding the general solutions there with these exponentials, either the minus, plus or minus j, uh, beta z. But like any solution to a uh, differential equation, there's constants involved there. We can find the solution to within a constant. How do we resolve the constants involved with the solutions to our uh, differential equations? Well, we always go through and resolve them by applying a boundary condition, by knowing the current at time t is equal to zero or the voltage at time, you know, t is equal to infinity or something like that. We can go back and find what those constants must be to satisfy those boundary conditions. In the case of a transmission line, our boundaries are pretty, pretty easy to see. We have one boundary, which is the end of one trans, one end of the transmission line, and the other boundary is the other end of our transmission line. What is connected to either end will lead to what those four complex constants must be. And so that's what, again, our analysis gets down to. Based on what's connected to the end, we apply a boundary condition. When we find the boundary condition, we can find these complex values. Once we find the complex values, we know the voltage and current at each and every place along our transmission line.